You are listening to the Big Blue Marble Podcast with Anwar Knight. Make the most of moments in the sun. Copper tone makes living in the sunshine fun. It gives the fastest and as you will quickly see. Cause nothing tears like copper tone naturally. So don't you be a pale face, get that sun. And get yourself some copper tone, it's number one. Get the fastest tan that anyone can. Tan don't burn, get a copper tone tan. Copper tone gives you the tan of your life. A tan that produces compliments galore. For beauty's sake, Copper Tone keeps your skin soft while giving best protection from the sun's burning rays. A tan that produces compliments galore and yet still giving protection from the sun's burning rays. <laughs> well, that cheesy commercial must have worked. You still know the name, don't you? Copper Tone. People are still buying it. That was from 1965, by the way, with Vic Damone, a post-war crooner that Frank Sinatra once said had the best pipes in the business. Frankie liked them. 55 years ago. And you know, Copper Tone Suntan Cream, as it was called, actually started out about 20 years prior to that commercial. It was a greasy substance of red veterinary petroleum jelly that Benjamin Green, an airman and pharmacist, used to protect himself and other soldiers from the sun's rays during World War II. He nicknamed it Red Vet Pet. It was thick, it was stinky, but it did provide a barrier between the skin and the sun. And then later, he had this idea of mixing this stinky, sticky paste with some nice smelling cocoa butter and coconut oil. Now, it was stinking good. It was that red vet pet that attracted the folks at Copper Tone. Eventually, it became Copper Tone Suntan Cream. And at the time, it was literally one of the biggest brands, certainly in North America. There were some other startups, including an Austrian chemist that uh, some documents suggest was the first to include the term SPF, so the sun protection factor. And in those days, it was just two, right? Now, fast forward today, the sun care industry is worth billions of dollars. There are dozens and dozens of different brands. And I'm not centering out Copper Tone. This industry is projected to reach $25 billion by 2024. There are lotions, SPF 15, broad spectrum gels, sprays and sticks, SPF 30, SPF 50. The list of products is long. And most of them, most of them, sure, they do in fact protect you from the dangerous rays of the sun. But more and more research is now also confirming that they dramatically affect life underwater. Many sunscreens are killing marine life in our oceans and lakes. A specific concoction of chemicals found in, in many common brand sunscreens that my guest says is not only killing reefs, but also creating zombie fish. On today's show, Dr. Craig Downs will join us. He is a forensic ecotoxicologist and has been researching the impacts on sunscreen use around the world. And as a result, some sunscreen bans are now being implemented in part because of his work. Whether you surf on ocean waves, enjoy an all-inclusive beach getaway, suntan at your local beach, or even tube along a river, if you use sunscreen, you need to listen to this show. Plus, also coming up, what SPF would you need for what now could be one of the hottest temperatures ever recorded on Earth? It happened just a few days ago in the U.S. I'll tell you where and how hot it got on another edition of The Blue Files. It's all coming up on this episode of The Big Blue Marble. Get the fastest tan that anyone can. Tan don't burn, get a copper tone tan. Have a question, comment, or show idea? Let us know at BigBlueMarble.org. From the state of Virginia, we join Dr. Craig Downs from Hereticus Environmental Laboratory, where he is the executive director. Welcome to the Big Blue Marble, Craig. Thank you, Mr. Knight. I really appreciate being on your show. Well, I'm so glad you could join us. I think many of our listeners will be quite surprised to learn just how big of a problem this phenomenon known as swimmer pollution has become. Uh, for a long time, it has been overlooked because I think it's hard to imagine at the core of this is the simple use of sunscreen. 
So let's start there. How much are we talking about here? So we estimate close to about 100 million tons are going into uh, coastal areas all over the world. And it is linked to tourism. 100 million tons. Yes. Wow. At the very least. And is all of this coming from people, you know, tourists that are just slathering it on as they hit a beach or a dive spot? It's coming from two ways. And it's predominantly from tourism and from um, world populations migrating to coastal areas and living in coastal areas. Um, there's a bay in Hawaii. It's really short, a very small bay, about 20 acres long. Uh, large, and they see about 6,000 to 9,000 people per day in that very small bay. Um, if you consider Lake Erie and Lake Huron, um, Lake Michigan, and all the beaches that are there and all the people that get into the water, it's easy to see how you can get thousands upon thousands of people at a very specific site getting into the water and the sunscreen coming off of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you included the Great Lakes because it's important to note this is not only affecting oceans. In fact, there is a significant link to Canadian waters, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But what is it? What is it in sunscreen that makes it so toxic? Um, what makes it toxic to wildlife are some of the sunscreen active ingredients and some of the preservatives. And we'll just focus in on the sunscreen active ingredients. Um, in the U.S., we, there's a, a 14 sunscreen ingredients that are allowed to be used, and some of the most common ones are called oxybenzone, uh, octocrylene, uh, homosalate, actinosate. Uh, they're really difficult words to pronounce, but they can make up as much as 30% of a sunscreen product um, volume to volume. So there's a lot of it in there. And yet most of us have no idea, and I include myself there. I, it, to some extent, you almost need a chemistry degree. We blindly assume because it is available for purchase and that we are putting it on our skin, it must be safe. And yes, it will protect us from the sun. Case closed. But clearly, there are a lot of other ingredients that are tainting our seas. So what happens when this list of chemicals that you know, many of them we can't pronounce what happens when it penetrates a water environment, an ecosystem? Is there a chain of events? What are some of those effects? The, the sunscreen plume, uh, the pollution plume is what we call, uh, enters into a coral reef system and it impacts all the organisms there. And some of the most obvious uh, organisms that are impacted are the corals themselves. Uh, one thing that we've learned is that these sunscreen chemicals cause a a pathology in corals called bleaching and corals are bright colors of orange and yellow and purple and brown and when they bleach they get paler and paler until they turn white and oftentimes those bleaching events can lead to mass mortality of coral reefs um, oftentimes these sunscreens can act synergistically with other environmental factors like climate change factors so corals bleach around 31 degrees Celsius, but if you have oxybenzone in the water at about uh, one part per billion, um, it can cause the corals to bleach around 27 degrees Celsius. So it actually exacerbates climate change factors. That is huge. The fact that the interaction of these chemicals are reducing the threshold of temperature sensitivity for perhaps the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Reefs likely rival terrestrial rainforests in terms of the contributions it does for the planet. And just days ago, the annual Global State of the Climate Report was released, and among the findings, sea surface temperatures second highest on record. And this report is a collaboration of over 500 scientists from over 60 countries. It's nothing small. This is a major report. So the heating of the oceans is already having a huge impact on reefs. We know that. And now the most threatened ecosystems on Earth are taking another hit. And it's primarily because of us. And you said, Craig, one part per billion? Yes, one part per billion easily causes corals uh, to begin the bleaching process. But other scientists have seen it go as low as about 200 parts per trillion. Um, so for marine algae, like uh, there's something called sea lettuce, and it's a big source of food for green sea turtles. 
it can see it can undergo bleaching from oxybenzone as low as 10 parts per trillion extremely low concentrations can do uh, a lot of harm so help me understand this when you're talking about so minute concentrations does that mean a single person splashing in the beach could be responsible for killing a reef not really a single bather um, because the water moves in and out. But if you imagine swimmers coming in around nine o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning and staying there till five thirty, six o'clock in the afternoon, that sunscreen is what's called a pseudo persistent organo pollutant. It gets refreshed all the time, especially between the, you know, the times of 9 AM to about five thirty PM. And so uh, even small areas can get, can see very high concentrations and this is the big problem that we're seeing all over the world is that places that people love to go right out in front of resorts those reefs are dying and they're not coming back and it's a big issue for tourism because if the the tourist value the the reason why tourists are going there isn't there well then they don't come back to that island yeah it makes so much sense now as you describe that beach scene i mean how many of us have booked an all-inclusive fun-in-the-sun holiday. You know, the routine of getting up early, dropping your towel or a book down on your favorite beach lounge or under that palm tree or cabana to hold your spot so nobody gets it. Then you go for breakfast only to return and spend the entire day in and out of the water. Each time, sunscreen is washing off. Thousands and thousands of people do that virtually every day. And you are absolutely right when it comes to the impact on tourism. Leave aside the ecological impact that we should be doing the right thing and protecting the Earth's incredible natural resources. But the other side here is that the world's reefs propel a $36 billion industry from on-reef tourism like diving, snorkeling, wildlife watching on the reefs themselves. And then, of course, the spin-offs, the hotels, the shopping, the car rental, dining, etc., and as a result of that, there has been some effort put forward now with the banning of certain sunscreens in some parts of the world. You mentioned Hawaii earlier. They'll be the first U.S. state, as you know, to implement a ban starting this coming January. And there are a few others. But do you think in time it will expand universally for all beach resort destinations? Um, unfortunately not. The science is so new that governments and regulators are, are coming at this perplexed uh, because no one really can get their mind around that, hey, just swimmers going out into the environment is having an impact. So um, within the United States, there's, there's big argument about, okay, what do we do? What concentration do we allow this to be? And um, you know, we're seeing this fracturing of legislation across the world. Palau has banned oxybenzone and a lot of other sunscreen chemicals. The U.S. Virgin Islands has banned it. Aruba, Bonaire, Galapagos. Uh, Mexico has banned it in its terrestrial uh, parks as well as its marine parks. Um, other countries are making that same consideration. Uh, but they have to do the science first to see how much is there and is it in the animals that are still around. Uh, they they do a lot of environmental forensics to see just how bad is it and how far is the pollution plume. Mm, so it's going to take time then. But let me ask you this. As I mentioned earlier, the, the sun care biz is very lucrative. Consumers spend billions and billions of dollars on products, but not all sunscreens are treated equal. Beyond the endless brand names, there are, in fact, as I discovered, essentially two different types of sun protection. There's chemical sunscreens, which, when you put it on, absorb and scatter the sun's harsh UV rays before it can damage the skin. And then there are mineral sunscreens, sometimes referred to as a sun block. And this product creates literally a barrier on the skin that, that filter out the UV rays. But how do they differ chemically? The chemical sunscreens um, usually contain oxybenzone or avobenzone and octocrylene. The sun blocks are the mineral sunscreens, which contain zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. But there are hybrid products out there that use both zinc oxide and, for example, oxybenzone or homosalate or any number of these chemical sunscreens in order to boost their SPF levels. Uh, it's a marketing gimmick that you need SPF 50 or higher. 
Um, the FDA and a number of medical associations say all you need is a product that's SPF 30 and you're good to go. Uh, what I would suggest is to use a, a good mineral sunscreen that is uh, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide are safe both for the environment and for, for humans. Okay, so between the two types, mineral-based sunscreens or sunblock, likely the better choice when it comes to not only protecting our skin, but also the environment. But still not a perfect solution. So is there anything else we can do? The best thing you can do to protect yourself from the sun and from and to protect the environment is to cover up with UPF clothing. Uh, UPF clothing is universal protection factor. It's very similar to SPF, but it's broad spectrum. It absorbs both UVA and UVB. And like most of the marketing uh, slogans with these UPF clothing, it's sunscreen that doesn't wash off. And it's sunscreen that you don't have to reapply. We work with a number of, of resorts and, and um, parks to try to get people uh, to wear at least a sun shirt. A sun shirt means that you're not putting 50% of the sunscreen on that you would normally put if you were just wearing a bikini or trunks. And a 50% reduction of sunscreen pollution in the environment is a big deal. Yeah, it would certainly add up. When you think about how many people are on a beach and if you could reduce the use by 50%. And your organization, Hereticus Environmental Laboratory, a nonprofit, has also created a certification seal called Protect Land and Sea. And this is something that consumers can look out for, much like a logo in the same way, you know, we look out for the blue and white fish logo with a check mark to indicate sustainable fishing practices. So what does that logo ensure when it comes to a sunscreen product? It's a simple certification that says this product um, does not contain these 11 substances, nor microplastics, uh, spheres or beads, nor uh, nanotized zinc or titanium dioxide particles. And that's a good first step for a product to be environmentally responsible because it doesn't contain oxybenzone, it doesn't contain actinosate or octocrylene, which are the UV filters, and it doesn't contain a number of preservatives that are starting to look like endocrine disruptors in the environment. And these are the parabens and triclosan. And for our listeners' benefit, we will also post that logo and the brands that have been certified in today's show notes because... That's a part of what we're trying to do here on The Big Blue Marble, empower and inspire people to take action. So here is now a choice. And as consumers, if you like a certain brand, then tell them. Tell them you will only buy it if it is reef safe, if it is certified, because that's how change happens. Absolutely. This is one of the, the biggest historical success stories in the environmental uh, movement and that it's the consumer making the choice. There really aren't a lot of laws regulating oxybenzone or actinosate, um, but it's consumers demanding from these companies, we don't want this in our product, we don't want it um, in us, and we don't want it in the environment, so give us something better. And, and this has changed that $10 billion a year industry significantly to move their product formulations to something safer. Do these chemicals ever break down? That's a good question. So oxybenzone, uh, depending on the the quality of the water, can last for 90 days to three years in a marine environment. Um, in a, a freshwater environment, uh, there's a study showing that it can last for at least six years. So some of these things are rather persistent. Uh, some of these chemicals do bioaccumulate, meaning they go up the food chain and they accumulate in fish and oysters and, and crawdads. Um, you know, they, they're they there. They're, they're true environmental pollutants. Now, you see, no one would ever have a clue about that, that these toxins could linger up to six years, and that's in fresh water. So now this is hitting close to home. Sunscreen is not just affecting oceans. Our Great Lakes, our rivers are not immune to this, and there's actually a pretty important Canadian connection that occurred not too long ago along the Cowichan River in B.C. So can you tell us about that? Yes, this is, um, this is a success story that's repeated around the world. 
it was a single individual that cared, a, a gentleman and his wife who lived um, on the river, uh, Joe Saisel, and he started making uh, a ruckus about it because he noticed that the caddis flies and the stone flies and the midges uh, disappeared from the river. Uh, there wouldn't be a hatching and, uh, and the trout and salmon began to disappear. And it all started when river tubing became very popular. And some of those uh, shops would rent 2,000 to 2,500 tubes on a, a given Saturday. So that's a lot of people going on the river, spraying several times while they're on the river, you know, applying sunscreen to, to their bodies and getting it into the water. Um, and he talked to these companies and the, the companies like you mentioned before, they care their jobs, their livelihood depends on the integrity of these ecosystems. So they went out and found sunscreens that they thought were compatible with their clientele and the environment, you know, so they were reef safe and river safe sunscreens that were predominantly zinc oxide. And that's what they're pushing. And, and so we're hoping that, um, Mr. Saysell's initiative really takes off and he does, he can see the trout and the salmon and then the caddis flies coming back. Yeah, me too. And there are likely other examples just like that, especially this year. Although there are still many restrictions due to COVID-19, here in Ontario, it has been a hot summer. You know, people are going to the cottages, they're swimming in lakes. Toronto has almost a dozen beaches. Some of them, in fact, are blue flag endorsed. There are literally thousands of people using sunscreen and then swimming in freshwater lakes and rivers. So over time, what could potentially unfold here? The people that will, f will see the manifestation of this damage first will be fishermen and natural resource management agencies that stock fish in those rivers and, and lakes. And that's because many of these sunscreen chemicals are endocrine disruptors. And they're estrogenic endocrine disruptors. They mimic estrogen. So it's like dumping a whole bunch of birth controls into a river, into a lake system. And what this does to many different species of fish is it causes feminization of those fish. All the males turn into females. And if you have a, a single sex population in the wild, that population usually means it'll go extinct. And that's what we saw. That's what we're seeing on coral reefs. This is what you can see in rivers and, and in lakes. Um, and this will have a huge impact on the recreational fishing industry. And then once those fish are gone, then everything else will go. This sounds like the plot of a sci-fi film. Y yes, it's kind of like the movie Children of Men. W what happens is, is these populations of these different species, whether they're fish or uh, insects, um, they become sterile. They become reproductively unviable. And we call these zombies. And we call these zombies because we can see the adults. We see the adult fish, we catch them, but we don't see are the, the juveniles, the larvae, the babies. And we don't notice that there's a missing generation until five, 10 years down the road when, wait a second, where did, where did everything go? And that's exactly what we're seeing on coral reefs all over the world are, is this zombification of, of these reefs, of these ecosystems where they're not sexually viable and they don't perpetuate themselves so um yeah we can you can see the big walleyes but where are the little ones there is just so much on the table here craig but the picture you've painted for us shows clearly that we can react and have a huge beneficial impact i think this is an easy thing to tackle from a public perspective and we can do this when you practice safe sun as i like to say just do it in a responsible way it not only enables marine ecosystems to survive, but also to some degree, it will help boost the efforts to help with climate change too. I, I think pollution reduces the resiliency of ecosystems to deal with climate change. So if you want to give ecosystems a fighting chance to evolve and to adapt to a, a climate changed environment, then you've got to deal with the pollution first and foremost. What's also interesting, if we go back to Caribbean coral reefs, for example, the Caribbean reefs lost most of their coral reefs between 1970 and 2000. This is before major climate change events occurred. 
you know, they lost about 80% of their coral reefs. So pollution is still one of the biggest problems out there that a lot of factors want you not to think about and, 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 and want you to forget and think about other things. But no, pollution's still out there. Everything we do can be seen as a form of pollution. It's whether or not we are smart enough and have the will to reduce our, our footprint. You know, whether it's our carbon footprint or our pollution pr- footprint. Dr. Downs, I don't think we will ever look at another tube of sunscreen the same again, which I think is a great thing. So thanks for that. Thank you for having me on. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. My guest has been Dr. Craig Downs. He is a forensic ecotoxicologist and executive director at Hereticus Environmental Laboratory. Time now to travel the world with another edition of The Blue Files. A tiny, adorable mammal with a long nose and big, bulgy eyes has been rediscovered after more than half a century. The Somali Senji, which resembles a field mouse with an elongated snout and actually related to elephants and aardvarks, has not been seen since 1973. Everything known about the obscure mini-mammal came from a handful of specimens that were collected decades ago and now stored in museums, according to a statement from Global Wildlife Conservation. It turns out locals knew of their elusive existence all along. So after doing interviews and analyzing possible dung piles, researchers set up over 1,200 traps across the rugged lands in the Horn of Africa. In total, they found 12 Somali Senjis, and they've recommended that the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species now be updated. By the way, it was peanut butter, oatmeal, and yeast that did the trick and lured them to the trap. An intense heat wave that has triggered power outages and wildfires across the American Southwest has also delivered what could be the hottest temperature in the world since 1913. California's Death Valley recorded an unbelievable 54.4 degrees Celsius or 130 degrees Fahrenheit on Sunday, August 16th. Usually the west and southwestern U.S. experience the North American monsoon during this time of year, said Daniel Burke from the National Weather Service in Las Vegas. But the monsoon hasn't developed as it typically does, so instead of heavy rainfall, Death Valley is getting hotter under pressure, Burke added. The National Weather Service measurement is now in the process of being verified. And finally, scientists say Greenland's melting ice sheet has now passed the point of no return. Snowfall that normally replenishes the glaciers each year can no longer keep up with the pace of ice melt, according to researchers at Ohio State University. And just to be clear, Greenland's ice is already the world's largest single contributor to sea level rise. Researchers say in the next 80 years, at its current melt rate, it would add another 2.75 inches, almost 7 centimeters, to global sea level. Our regular listeners may recall an episode we did about the Greenland melt with Martin Stendell, climate scientist with the Danish Meteorological Institute. He highlighted the ice sheet loss of 55 billion tons of water that occurred over just five days due to a heat wave in 2019. That's episode two, by the way, and it's still available on our website at bigbluemarble.earth. And that's this edition of The Blue Fox. Just as we wrap up, I wanted to kindly remind you again, we'll be posting the Protect Land and Sea logo in today's show notes. And I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting for a second to avoid sunscreen completely. Skin cancer is real and it affects millions of people each year. As for the SPF filter 30, 50 or higher, the FDA is different than Health Canada, but both are working in the best interest for the public. For the record, studies suggest SPF 30 filters out about 97% of the UV rays, while SPF 50 does 98%. And no sunscreen protects you 100% completely. But use your own discretion. I think the more we know and pressure the big companies, the list of sunscreens that are not only safe for us, but also for marine life will grow, and that's very important. If you like today's show, tell a friend and share it. Or retweet my post on Twitter and Instagram at Anwar Knight. On Facebook, you can find me at Anwar Knight TV. 
I really appreciate you following me, and be sure to also subscribe to the podcast. You can even leave a review, too, if you have a moment. And on our website at bigbluemarble.earth, you can also subscribe to our newsletter. This month's edition is on the way in about a week. One of the stories we're working on, scientists have discovered new colonies of emperor penguins. And you know how they found them? They tracked poo stains on glacial ice by satellite. Think how big that has to be to see from space. That's just one of the stories in this month's edition of our newsletter that's delivered free to your inbox. On that note, episode 16 comes to a close. Thank you for listening. I really appreciated your company. I'm Anwar Knight, wishing you a great day on the Big Blue Marble. Hey, Dad, that was an awesome show.